Thank you for that kind welcome, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to talk with you today. I think we, like you, are an organization, a confederation, that really wants to advance science. We want to use um, current science now and emerging science in the future to help build tools and information products that can support decision making across the country. Um, so I think we have a lot in common, and I think this can be very fruitful areas for, for discussion. Um, let me just give you a quick sense of USGCRP as an organization. We are a confederation of 13 federal agencies. We're a long-lived organization uh, established by presidential initiative in 1989. We are actually a confederation of the legally mandated um, by the GCRA. The agencies are required to participate. Most of the time that actually winds up being a coalition of the willing uh, as long as we do the right things and find the right areas of consensus to work on. Um, as you look at the vision here, you see a nation globally engaged and guided by science. If you look at the mission, you see um, that ours is to build a knowledge base that inf informs human response through federal coordinated federal research programs. So we've got a national vision and a federal mission. And if you think about the gap in there, um, there is one. And I think it's through groups like yours and the, the outreach that your member organizations have that we try to bridge that gap. So some of that discussion today can be about how we can help each other bridge that gap from a national a federal science program to national response. Um, USGCRP is really built on three pillars. Um, one of which comes down from the Global Change Research Act, one of which is the strategic plan that we'll talk about more in a minute, and the other is the, um, the priorities of successive administrations. And fortunately, um, there's a lot of alignment across those three, and that's more by design than accident. Um, so if you look at the GCRA in that first column, um, we're tasked to build a national research program that helps the country and the world understand, predict, assess, and respond to both the uh, natural and human-induced uh, causes of global change. Now, if you look at the central column, you see our strategic plan for 2012 to 2021, where I've kind of mapped our four goals to the elements of the uh, Global Change Research Act. It's not perfect, but you see a lot of uh, uh, continuity across those two columns. I want to take a minute and say that the US GCRP of eight years ago was really focused on advanced science, a phenomenal job of, of advancing that science. That's still a very central priority for us. It's the foundation for everything else we do. But in the strategic plan for 2012, 2021, we've really begun to focus attention as well on informing decisions, conducting sustained assessments, and communication and education. Things that were kind of in the program before, but not in as not in as quite as substantive, as focused, and as integrative a way. Now, if you look at the extreme right column, you see some of the administration priorities that also guide uh, USGCRP. Uh, and they come down to us in guidance from OMB and OSTP. Sorry, do you any water? Any water? I'm kind of losing. Thank you. Um, so these are guidances that come down from OMB and OSTP telling the agencies where they want them to focus budget attention um, in their annual budget development. There is the President's Climate Action Plan, PCAP, uh, and there are executive orders, that too, that particularly focus on adaptation to climate change. And so in that right column, I've indicated some of the areas where we think the President's Climate Action Plan uh, is telling us what we should be doing in ways that align with our strategic plan and, uh, and with the GCRA. And again, more by accident than by design. So before I go too much further, I want to talk a bit about the organization. Um, and I'm not going to walk you through all the goriness of our wiring diagram. I know you don't care about our spaghetti. Um, but are there are a couple of points I did want to make on this. Um, And that was really well-timed because this gave you time to look at this and come up with your questions on it. Um, let's see. So this is the um, Executive Office of the President's Science Apparatus over here. Um, the Subcommittee on Global Change Research 
is made up of the top climate officials in each of our 13 member agencies. And our members are those parts of the agencies that are involved in science and research and development. Um, they serve as the board of directors overseeing the whole program. And what I want, want you to see in part is that they interact consistently um, in a uh, sustained way with the Committee on Environment and Natural Resources and Sustainability, which has many other subcommittees that work in the areas of environment and climate. So one way that we connect to the larger US government enterprise is through that NSTC structure and the Committee on Environment, CENRS, as we call it. Um, this group serves as our board of directors, and they oversee the whole program, um, which is largely implemented through a range of interagency working groups. I'm not going to walk you through all of those groups. I do want to point out a couple that are new. So we have, we went from a program that had mostly science working groups um, focused on process research, observations, carbon cycle, things like that. We continue, continue with those. But we have a working group on climate change and human health. Uh, we have an adaptation science working group. And we have a social sciences coordinating committee, which is trying to help us bring the SBE community together with the climate community to solve a lot of the, or to at least work on a lot of the kinds of problems that Susan was talking about a few minutes ago. Now, if you look at this diagram and you think, OK, there's a White House level, there's an agency level, and there's a working group level, how do you get those groups all working together and talking together? That's a really good question. We'll talk a little bit about how we do that as we go down this talk. Um, but it's a perpetual challenge. We spend a lot of time thinking about how we integrate across the layers uh, of the program, as well as across these disciplinary areas. So integrated research, Susan, is something that we spend a lot of time thinking about. I would say that on the pure research end, getting that integration is turning out to be easier and easier. Um, where we find lots of difficulty is actually in building that translational science cohort that wants to sit at the interface of the basic research and its translation for use and application. OK, so yeah, this is, I wanted to give you just a quick overview of our strategic plan. Um, one of the th couple of things I should say is that in our strategic <coughs> plan, um, we stick to the mandate that we have from Congress and from the administration, successive administrations, which is that our work is meant to be policy relevant, but policy neutral. So we do not get into policy issues. We do the science that we think is needed to make good policy decisions. Um, the way this diagram is set up under the each of the four column headers is the four goals of the strategic plan. If you read down each of the columns, you see the, f the objectives that we have under each of those four goals. And in the areas that are bolded, if you read across, you see um, sort of connecting topics in our different goals that cut across the program. So this is part of how we try to integrate across the program is you know, science for adaptation and mitigation, for example, links up to um, the work that we're doing to inform adaptation decisions and mitigation decisions. Our uh, national climate assessment, which is part of our sustained assessment goal, is completely plugged into informing a whole wide range of responses to, to global change and climate change. Uh, and we're working at increasing engagement as a way of helping us do all of those things. If you look across the bottom row, you see that man information management and sharing for scientists, for resource managers, um, for the general public, um, for climate interested um, educators and students. There are um, information management and, and, and sharing um, objectives that cut across the program as well. So these are some of our connectors. Uh, another couple of connectors include um, producing, providing information on the scales at which decisions are made. And I think, is Bill, that actually does get to trying to provide the kind of information needed on regional scales for regional scale decision making. There are lots of challenges with that that we can come back and talk to, but it is something that the program is very explicitly focused on. So a couple of things about the strategic plan. I think one is that the doing of it 
not the releasing of it, but the doing of it was very important for getting the agencies to align their viewpoints and think about how their programs each support each other in this more um, expansive view of USGCRP. So we had a, more than 100 federal scientists working on this for a year, um, detailed discussions across the agencies uh, and with the principals, the lead climate officers from each agency, to come up with a strategic plan that all of the agencies could buy into. Now, to get to that point, um, the strategic plan is what we call decadal and aspirational, meaning it's very high level, um, but it is something that all of the agencies could buy into. And so when the conversation, when the introduction went from strategic planning to implementation planning, I saw you laugh a little. And you're right, in a way, that it's difficult. You know, the harder part is getting to the implementation planning because some things go forward and some things don't. And so when you're at that high strategic level, it's easier to encompass the goals and hopes and aspirations of all of your members. When you get down to implementing some things and not others, it's harder. But how do we do this? What do we do and how do we do this? Um, a really important part is the agency foundational activities. So USGCRP is a $2.6 billion annual research program um, that's implemented through agency activities. And you see on that list a lot of the things that our agencies do um, individually or collectively. Uh, and I'll just, I'm not going to read through all of this. I just want to make a couple of points. Um, for modeling, I think what you see is things that you would recognize as uh, comprehensive climate models, global climate, climate, global circulation models, things that flow down from them. We're also working on uh, coupled modeling, com intercomparisons, and multi-model ensembles to try to reduce uncertainties. So I think those are things that you might think of as typical climate models. One of the things that we're working on, reaching towards, struggling a bit with, is how do we bridge to models that decision makers need, um, which are not always those same complex, comprehensive um, uh, climate models. So, so we do look at integrated assessment models as a way of pulling together a wider spectrum of both um, geophysical, biophysical, and human aspects of the climate system. Um, with a particular focus, I'd say, right now, on water, energy, and climate. One of the discussions, and by the way, I wanted to apologize for not being able to be here yesterday. We were meeting with the uh, National Research Council's Committee to Advise USGCRP, talking about where their, their informal review of where we are in implementing our strategic plan and where they might help us to accelerate progress in some areas. And one of the things we talked about was exactly what are the decision needs that should drive science planning. Uh, and. Um, what kinds of information do decision makers need to make those decisions? We talked a bit about the balance that we should have between deterministic models, probabilistic models, and what we would call um, possibility models. You know, what are possible future conditions? What, what are the impacts of those conditions? What are the risks associated with those possible future conditions? And how can that help people plan? Um, so part of what we're talking about um, in the modeling domain, um, regional science capabilities. I think, Susan, you had alluded to the USDA climate center hubs. Um, three or four of our agencies do have uh, regional associations. Uh, and they're part, they've worked very closely with our national climate assessment. They're part of what we're trying to use in a more systematic way to help share our information with end users uh, and understand through these regional associations what the science needs are uh, in the different communities at different scales. Um, lots of information management and sharing stuff going on across the agencies and EOP. We'll come back and look at a few of those in a minute. And we don't have big programs in climate change education, but we do have some across the agencies. And you can see some of the things there that they're focused on. Um, so those, I'm like you, Susan, I don't like standing behind a podium. And it's not just because I'm short, although that helps. Um, I just distracted myself. So the, the work across the agencies is foundational to everything that the program does. 
Um, but some of that would go on without USGCRP. So what is it that we, USGCRP, do as a program to both um, foster that coordination across the agencies uh, and to actually help link up what happens at the White House level, what happens at the agency level, and what happens at the interagency level through those working groups. And our interagency priority process is really important for doing that. So each year, um, the agencies come together, um, input from the working group level, um, guidance from the White House level on where, where there are common interests, and we pull together a set of um, annual priorities that require um, a collective effort, not just a single agency. Um, they depend on the single agency foundational activities of the sort you saw, um, but they're really the tip of the iceberg that depends on the rest of the program. And then we provide these to OMB and OSTP. We say, you know, here's what you told us you want to see the program focusing on. Here's how we want to do it. So we provide a memo each year to OMB and OSTP that outlines some of these, that outlines these priorities, um, how they tie to the PCAP and, and to the annual guidance memos from, from the executive office. Uh, and we sit down and we have conversations with OMB and OSTP. All of, the, all of the principals come together, they talk with OMB, OSTP, they say, here's our program, here's, here's what we did last year, here's how we want to evolve those priorities this year and next year. Here's where we think some of the near-term payoffs are, here's where we think the long, longer-term science priorities sit, uh, and that's what we want to emphasize. And so I wanted to give you a sense of some of what those are. So extremes, thresholds, and tipping points. So in the backdrop science program, there are things like uncertain um, observations, building observational capabilities that allow you to look at often short-term events that often happen on regional scales. So building an observational capability for understanding extremes, thresholds, and tipping points. Um, having the resolution that allows us to do that, um, looking at the interplay of cascading effects. And so, for example, how potential thresholds in the climate system might lead to tipping points in social systems. Those are all some of the things that we're looking at as a backdrop to um, this topic. And now we've got a particular focus that looks at the drought, at drought uh, and the Arctic. And I'll come back and talk about drought in a minute. Coupled Earth and Human Systems, this is something we talk about a lot. This is something we're still struggling to learn how to do. Um, but I think one of our center points for this is developing the computational software people power insight to be able to do predictions uh, at the intraseasonal to centennial scale. So intraseasonal headed towards that intersection of weather and climate uh, and to Centennial to the time scales that, for example, the De Department of Transportation or the military might want when they're thinking about how to build infrastructure, how to site it, and where not to site it. Um, actionable science for informed policymaking. This is a, a new part of our program. I think it's been really productive. I think a couple of areas that we really work on is we work with the agencies who, by executive order, have to do planning for how they will adapt to climate change. There's science needs in there, and we work with them to meet those, understand what those science needs are, use our current science to feed them, and help shape future science planning, uh, and adaptation resources. Um, reaching decision makers. I mean, these are people like you, like your organizations. Um, the National Climate Assessment is a big part of what we do. I'll come back and talk about that in a minute. Um, we have a global change information system that we, and I'll talk about that as well. Citizen science, next generation science standards, those are all things that we're working on, that we focus on as an interagency collective. But our goal here really is to get information out in the hands of the people who can use it. So the third National Climate Assessment is something we're really proud of. It came out in May of um, this year. Uh, and I think you see there the main topics that were the, in the report. Um, this may sound fairly mundane, but I think a couple of things I'd like to point out. One is that sectors included the um, agriculture. It also included the first ever National Assessment Chapter on Mitigation. Um, 
and it included response strategies, um, which is also the first time that a national assessment has addressed those kinds of strategies. So it, it was, let's see, about a 1,300-page document. Um, has a broad and deep science foundation. It was put together by, by more than 300 scientists. There were something on the order of 15, is that right? Yeah, 25, sorry, technical input reports, which were like mini assessments in particular regions or particular sectors um, developed by the federal agencies, by NGOs, by academic groups. Um, there were more than 500 contributions to the NCA um, from organizations outside the federal government. So I think this is a way in which we've really tried to engage um, stakeholders, uh, decision makers across the regions and the states. Um, from that really big, strong, broad science foundation, uh, a team of um, about uh, 300 scientists distilled, digested, synthesized to come up with high-level science findings of climate change impacts. Uh, and if anybody is interested, that's available through our website. There's an overview document and there's a highlights document, as well as the long document. Um, so the NCA report itself on our website is searchable, it's sortable, um, it's connected and shareable through um, social media, and we link the high-level findings to the detailed scientific background through this global change information system. So if you click on an image in, in the assessment, you can find who produced the data, who produced it, um, what data sets they used, what sensors uh, provided the data, um, and what references were used in reaching those findings. So we worked very hard to provide science that's both credible, accessible, um, and easily, easily used by people who are not science specialists. So the findings are written in plain language. And it's been really widely cited. You know, you can see some of the statistics there. Um, we're now up to more than, um, more than a mil million web hits uh, and more than a terabyte of downloads of climate information from the NCA. So it's been very widely used. And one of its main conclusions is that climate change is happening today. It's, hap it's affecting communities across the country now. Um, we are looking f ahead. We're doing multiple other assessments now, including one on climate change and human health, one on um, uh, food security, which I'll talk a bit about in a minute, uh, and one on the Arctic. And that one is actually focused ex explicitly on adaptation actions for a changing Arctic. Now, one of the things we know, so for us, the, the NCA is kind of a game changer. It's gotten very wide citation. Uh, it's been used um, by lots of organizations in making their case for uh, adapting to climate change or responding, or not. Um, but we know that an assessment by itself isn't going to provide people everything they need to use to make decisions. So there's um, a very wide and sustained effort to um, develop products that use NCA materials that can be more targeted to individual kinds of communities, sectors, individual kinds of, of decisions. And so you see under that there are some of the things where uh, our work is being used and where we're working to build um, connections and partnerships and the L word leverage that can um, help get the products used more widely uh, and be um, customized for um, specific needs. One of the ways we do this is through our NCA net. And some of your member organizations are, parts, are a part of our NCA net. Um, and you can see them on the website. You don't need to find them in this little diagram. Um, but there are more than 150 um, organizations and, and that have come together as part of the NCA net based on the affinity groups that you see there. And they both provided input to the NCA. Um, they helped figure out how we should engage uh, with communities, what the outreach program should be when the NCA rolled out. Um, and they're now part of what we're trying to use more broadly in the program as we try to make sure that our science really is in forms that people can use more widely to, to make decisions and take actions. 
Yeah, that wasn't what I meant to do. Um, so right now, um, USDA and several other um, USGCRP agencies have um, released for public comment uh, a, an assessment of global climate change, food security, and the US food system. So like all of the things that USGCRP does, it is um, focused on science, not policy. Um, but you see there some of the um, elements of the scope of the, um, of the assessment. Um, and it is open for public comment now. So anyone who wants to take a look at that, and anyone who wants to register your comments on it, can go to the web website uh, at the bottom of the page. Um, but I think that one of their major conclusions is consistent with what you've been talking about here, which is that climate change is going to affect uh, food, global food production and U.S. food production from mid-century uh, on. And so it is, it is a big effect. I want to talk a, few, a minute about another thing that we're doing. Um, which is our priority on extremes, which includes water cycle extremes and drought. Uh, and so I think you see here some of the things that are going on. What I wanted to particularly point out to you is that there is, in FY13, 14, and in this coming year, there are a, quite a range of observations coming online that speak to the water cycle. So the um, Global precipitation measurement system was launched. The uh, atmospheric uh, cloud aerosol precipitation experiment is going. Soil moisture, active and passive for sensing soil moisture from space, is, is, on, is coming up. Uh, along with, for example, NOAA and um, USDA soil moisture networks. Um, we will be launching in um, a cloud aerosol transport system. So these are all things that are trying to look at the water cycle in, in general, they include looking at things that connect directly to um, agriculture in particular. And um, I think I'll leave it at that. We can come back to any of these when you, if you'd like. I don't want to talk too long. Um, I want to leave us with, um, or not quite, my next to the last slide is about the USGCRP Research Enterprise. And I'm going to use my hands for this. You know, our, our traditional strength has been in advancing science. Uh, and you see that on the left, um, where our goal is to create new knowledge. Um, the other three goals of our strategic plan to inform decisions, conduct sustained assessments, and um, communicate and educate, we envision as being like three fingers of a hand. And we want that hand to be in a perpetual handshake um, with the advancing science. So that current science is being used to um, support the translation uh, and, act and assessments of knowledge for societal use, even as we continue to develop science that focuses on emerging issues that we may be that may be topics for adaptation and mitigation 30 years from now. Um, we're in the process, and I wouldn't say we're complete yet, but we're we're working to build a complete loop that runs through the science and stakeholder community that uses our ability to translate, provide, and assess knowledge for societal use to feed back into the science planning and prioritization uh, and to build the communities and the discussions across those two parts of the program that actually can have a common vocabulary and some common goals uh, and some co combined planning. So I'll... And I think this is where organizations like yours come in with the reach that you have. Um, so that, you know, how can we understand the needs of your communities? How can we, through you, um, help get information to them that they need? So one of the ongoing discussions within USGCRP as we move to this new strategic plan is where should USGCRP end? Where do other organizations partner in with us and what should the nature of the boundary look like so that those partnerships can be effective? What should USGCRP be doing to make it easier for organizations like you to do what you want to be doing? And I'll just leave you with this last slide, which you all have, which is um, some resources and links to some of the things that I've talked about today. Um, I do want to point out just a couple of things on the slide, though which is 
um, let's see, the Climate Resilience Toolkit um, is part of the President's Climate Action Plan developed by NOAA and other USGCRP agencies. You see the website there. It's really based around um, information tools that people can use to solve problems. So if you go to the website, it asks you to identify your problem, talk about your vulnerabilities, look at approaches, find data. Um, very oriented to people who want to use information to solve problems. The um, Climate Data Initiative um, yesterday rolled out uh, a new tranche uh, of uh, information that is based around ecosystems. Um, so the ecosystem uh, data release goes along with um, previous ones on um, sea level rise and coastal, coastal communities and sea level rise and agriculture. And it will be followed up by one on climate change and human health. Uh, and one of the focuses of the Climate Data Initiative is private-public partnerships. So for all of these data sets that are rolled out, there are private companies that are committed to helping to develop tools for their sectors uh, and markets. Um, and then last week, the um, White House announced a climate education, literacy, and training initiative, and you see the link to that there. Uh, and it's focused on things within the U.S. government and beyond the U.S. government that help um, provide both education, um, literacy, and training. So speaking to some of those human capital aspects that we mentioned a few minutes ago. So uh, sitting behind these are a few other slides that talk, show you who the, who the climate officers are that participate in U.S. GCRP, talk a bit about which agencies participate in which parts of our programs, and a little bit more about the strategic plan. But I'll leave those for you to look at later, and I guess I'm open for questions. <laughs>